Hi, Stephen e. Andrews here. Welcome to Outlaw Bookseller, the premier expert channel on SF and other stuff as well. So today we're going to talk about dystopias. Dystopias, how tiresome. Well, <laughs> it's not tiresome, it's fascinating, but I, I get a certain sinking feeling regularly in work, especially I get asked this by young people and they say, oh, can you recommend me some dystopias? And of course, what they want is they want novels in which the dystopia is foregrounded. Now, of course, most of the great dystopian ideas have been foregrounded in novels decades ago. You know, I mean, look at We by Zamyatin, you know, it's just over a century ago. Jack London's Iron Heel, again, over a, over a century ago. You know, so it's like, the classics are out there. So you say to them, have you done 1984? Yes. Have we done Brave New World? Yes. And then of course, you, have you done We? Some of them have. You know, and have you done Fahrenheit 451? Some of them have and so on. So let's have a look at these books anyway. Now I don't have my copy of We to hand. It's a Penguin Modern Classic. It's at the bottom of the bookcase. I'll have to show it to you again. But I mean, you know, great stuff, isn't it? Absolutely great stuff. Lovely. So I think I have four copies of this. So yeah, so we know that one, 1950s, you know, and the one that, you know, it may be in print, there may be a print on demand edition. London is poorly served these days is his socialist um, dystopia, or socialist revolution, um, utopia, I guess you could say, the Iron Heel, which Orwell was influenced by because that predates um, 1984 and it predates Brave New World as well. I haven't got my copy of Brave New World down, which is shocking. I think I'd better get it really. Brave New World, absolute classic, of course. 1920s, Huxley taught Orwell. Um, Huxley was a teacher and Orwell was a pupil. So there you go. Um, anthrax, bombs, genetic engineering, marvelous stuff. Stylistically, very, very 1920s, but you know, it's not dated, it's of its time and that's what counts. And, you know, important stuff, so you should read that as well. Virtual reality, the feelies. I mean, he really was way ahead. What a brilliant man he was. So, you know, you've got those. <clears throat> and you've got my favourite book of all time, 1984. Now, this is interesting. I'm going di to digress slightly here. 1984. See the title? 1984 in words. Don't ever buy any edition that has 1984 on the cover. Why? Because 1984 is a number and 1984 is short for 1984. It can be read as 1984. If you didn't know the book, you could read it as 1984 rather than 1984. And the point is, is that it's conflated. It's newspeak and newspeak is more important than telescreens. It's more important than the floating fortresses or any of the other SF elements or any of the elements the party used to oppress Winston Smith and everybody else in Oceania. Newspeak, the conflation and reduction and limiting of thought through language shrinking. So it's 1984. And since Orwell went out of copyright recently, we've seen a flurry of new editions of 1984. This one, the Golanx Masterwick one, has been conspicuous by its absence in bookshops and this is shocking because 1984 was a science fiction novel and there's a video on my channel all about why and how it's a science fiction novel and it's got the ministry of love on the cover there and you know this is a great 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 edition it has an introduction by ian dent a political writer which is fantastic which talks about descartes and the limiting of thought is absolutely magnificent. So if you're going to buy an edition, either buy the Penguin Modern Classic or buy this one. Don't buy the Faber one. The Faber one has 1984 on the cover and on the title page. And the Faber one is missing the appendix. Now, the appendix of 1984 is a chapter of the book. And it is part of the narrative because it subtly reveals what happens in the world of Oceania long after Winston Smith's death. So it is part of the narrative. It's part of the story. Faber just left it out to save money, probably. Or, you know, either that or somebody just made a mistake. And I hate to have a go at them because Faber used to be one of the great British publishers, but they really have made a mess of it. So don't buy the Faber one. Buy this one or the Penguin Modern Classic one. This is the introduction of this is fantastic. Really, really good. And well done, Golanx. A beautiful edition. And sadly, we've seen all too little of it in Britain's bookshops. So, booksellers, get this copy in and stack it high. So, 
you know, the, the classics of dystopian literature. Let's step back a moment and talk about the word. Until about 10, 12 years ago, you never heard the word dystopia. Hardly anybody knew what it meant. The only people using it were science fiction critics, science fiction readers, and it had long been used in SF circles for decades and decades and decades and decades. Obviously, they were literary critics who, who knew about it, who they used alternative terms often. And of course, it comes from Thomas More's Utopia, literally no place. And the whole idea of utopia novels is that they try and show a perfect society. Now, of course, most of them are satirical because there's no such thing as a, as a perfect society. And, you know, attempts to sort of do utopian SF often fail because the, the great beauty of dystopia is it creates conflict and drama. So when I'm asked the question, you recommend me some dystopian novels. I come back and after I've gone through this obvious things and there will be, these, be some trendy one which came out last week and will be gone in a year. Um, the sort of thing that, um, is it Christine Doucher writes, you know, they pick these scenarios and they're just dreadful. And you get The Handmaid's Tale, you know, which is all very well and good if you're a Johnny-come-lately feminist in SF. You know, if you really know your stuff, you'll have read The Female Man by Joanna Russ, Woman on the Edge of Time by Marge Piercy, Kindred by Octavia Butler. You know, all these books are predate um, <clears throat> Atwood by many, many years, you know, so she was sort of a late comer then. It's not a great book, really. It's it's just really, really crude and, and poorly put together, in my opinion. I know she's revered by many, but I really don't think a lot of Atwood at all, I have to say. Anyway, that aside, dystopia is the background condition of most SF. Most SF paradigms, when you start to pick up a science fiction novel and you get that opening paragraph and the world is revealed to you gradually, then, or, or with a punch, as it is, say, in 1984, or an inverted world, you get this thing where, you know, they're mostly dystopian backgrounds because, as Alfred North Whitehead, the philosopher and mathematician, said, it is the business of the future to be dangerous. If you have a dystopian background in SF, you immediately have something for the characters to kick against. Philip K. Dick, nearly all his stuff is dystopian backgrounds. It's common. I mean, probably 90% of SF has dystopian backgrounds. You know, it's, it's, it's the thing. So when young people particularly ask me about recommending dystopian novels, the ones I want to recommend are often not in print, you know, it's, or, you know, they're not accessible or they're not popular. So it's a real issue. But I say to people, you know, Dystopia is the background condition of most science fiction. So if you read people like, if you read Asimov, you know, The, the Naked Sun, um, Caves of Steel, I should say, the first of um, the robot books. You know, the people in that, they live in a dystopian society. They live crushed into underground cities, but they don't realise it's dystopian. You know, there's all sorts of ironies and things in dystopian fiction that come from Thomas More's Utopia. Some people say that, you know, Plato's Republic, as he sort of painted it, was a dystopian society because, of course, it was the kind of republic where not everybody was free, you know, slaves, women, what have you. And I thought today I'd talk you through some of the lesser known dystopian novels, which I really like, recommend them to you so you can have a read, give them a go, see what you think. And I started going through my shelves and I, I found so many dystopian novels, it was just wasn't true. And I thought I'll narrow it down to a few obscure things that you're probably not aware of, because this channel is, is not just about the obvious stuff, it's about discovering the cutting edge and the unusual things. So I'm going to sort of highlight some books which um, are lesser known. Um, than you know the famous ones and they should be so do get the famous ones under your belt first they're all really good you know they're all worth reading you know 1984 Brave New World and um, The Iron Heel um, Sam Yatin's We Final 8451 these are all key books you know and um, read some of the feminist ones there's great feminist ones by people like Russ and Charnas and you know these are fantastic stuff so there are great ones out there so I'm going to begin with one from genre SF from one of our favourite writers. My copy of 1984 keeps falling over and I can't, I can't have that. So I'll just settle everything a moment before we go any further, oh, honestly. Um, it's The World Inside by Robert Silverberg. Now I reread this recently because Matt at book Bookpelled. Hey Matt, hope you're okay mate. Um, my hero, um, he he of the sci-fi place. Only time you hear sci-fi on this channel is when I mention Matt's sci-fi place. Um, he loves this book and rightly so because it's fantastic. And Silverberg is the man. You know I do love my Silverberg. This is the UK Millington first edition hardcover. I have shown it before, and I've recently reread this, and it wasn't one of my favourites. 
compared to a lot of things from Silver Bill's great period, 67 to 75 more or less. But I did enjoy rereading it. I felt it was a little bit too long. There is a lot of sex in it and I felt maybe too much, but it's an integral part of the society. And this is basically an overpopulation novel and overpopulation novels by default the dystopias. My favorite one is Harry Harrison's Make Room, Make Room, filmed as Silent Green, which you will have seen, of course. If you haven't read Make Room, Make Room, there's no excuse, it's in print. Looks like this. And the basic idea of this is that mankind solves the overpopulation problem by building upward to huge skyscrapers and nobody goes outside. Everybody lives in the skyscrapers. They have their own social structures and the rest of the world is pretty much turned over to agriculture. And there's a small number of people living outside and they do all the agriculture, a lot of which is sort of mechanized. And this is just follows um, half a dozen or so characters who are already well drawn in this society where it's not a question of people saying, oh, you know, we can't breed, we can't have children. They're encouraged to be fertile and, you know, they're encouraged to be the God wants them to be fertile. So there's a lot of religion in this and there's a lot of sex in it. Um, but is there transcendence? You know, the, the Silverberg themes of that period, which really mark him, power, transcendence, transformation, what have you. There's one character who eventually goes outside. And this is, you know, this is a classic sort of thing from this sort of narrative. We see it in Asimov, as I say, in um, Caves of Steel. We see it in George Lucas's first science fiction film, THX 1138, far more interesting than the dull and tedious Star Wars, which does have its moments of poetry and it does have Carrie Fisher. And it, I love that throne room sequence at the end. If there's one thing I like in Star Wars, it's that sequence at the end where they get decorated. That really gets me, I don't know why. Um, but otherwise I think it's a kid's film. But yeah, THX 1138, you know, getting outside, it's a common thing, you know, it's there in Brave New World, it's there in Angela Carter's Heroes and Villains, it's a thing. And it's done in this and it's really good. And, you know, Silverberg, great texture, great character, sharpness. He writes about sex very well. There is a lot of sex because in this, it's a dystopian society where, where men can pretty much have sex with anybody they want anytime, you know, and it's, it's, um, it's quite uncomfortable in lots of ways, but it's a good book, but it's not one of my favorites. I did enjoy rereading it and it's made me think about how much I love rereading. And I'm going to do a lot of reviews on the channel over the years to come, we hope, because I'm an old guy and I've read a lot and a lot of classic stuff, which people are reading for the first time or want to discover. I'm going to do lots of re-reviews where uh, when I reread an, an old book, which I love, which I haven't read for a long time, I'm going to review it again and talk about how one's perception changes because it does change. My perception of World Inside was very much that I enjoyed it more the second time around than the first time. The first time, I think I compared it unfairly to his very best books, things like Dying Inside, The Book of Skulls, Downward to the Earth, Time of Changes, Man in the Maze. And it is really good. I mean, you know, a, an average book by Silverberg is, you know, a great book compared to anybody else. So, so it was good. I did enjoy it and I enjoyed it, but I still feel there's a little bit too much sex in it, even though it's an integral part of the plot. You do get rather bored with it. You know, <laughs> it's a bit too much, but wonderful stuff. The outside sequences, fantastic, really good. Logan's Run, again, is another example of that. And Logan's Run, a great dystopian novel, which I was going to include in this, but the copy I've got is like a faux leather one. Logan's Run, if you haven't read the book, um, it is hard to get. It has been in print in the UK for years. I think there was talk about a Masterworks edition at one point. I don't think it's been in print in Britain since the 70s. It's quite different to the film, as much fun as the film is. It's also been critiqued as being one of the worst SF films ever. Um, the book is short, sharp, astringent, and the tone of it is just almost more like Ballard than anybody else. It's a very new wave sort of tone. The content isn't very Ballardian, but the tone and the, and the pro style, and you know, it's it's a good book. And um, Nolan and Johnson did a fantastic job. And the only thing I would say is that there's quite a lot of sex in it again. The people in the world of Logan's Run, they have to sort of go into a retirement, as it were, at age 21, not 30, which tends to sharpen it up. In that way, I think World Inside possibly had an influence over it, because I think World Inside precedes it by a few years, because everybody in that is quite young as well, generally speaking. And it, it's a lot broader, though, than, than the film. So Logan's Run, what we're picking up, there is a bit of a preoccupation with S&M 
um, in it as well. There's a lot of whipping and things like that goes on. And that comes across too in the sequel, Logan's World. I don't think I've ever read the third one, which I think is called Logan's Quest. Very, very hard book to find, you know, but, but great fun. So Logan's Run, great dystopia. So moving on, looking at some other dystopias and one that you probably haven't read because it's marketed and published as a mainstream novel. It's a book that came out quite some time ago. I think it was in the 90s. I remember it first appearing and I think it was published by Bloomsbury. Let's have a look at my edition here. Um, okay, let's see. 2005. I would have said it was before that. Um, Hmm, I'm slightly confused about that. I'd say it was earlier. This is Divided Kingdom by Rupert Thompson. This is the US vintage edition, which is very pretty. You generally won't find this in the UK. There's a, a, a very plain paperback of it. And Rupert Thompson is a very gift gifted novelist. He can pretty much write anything. And he does what he likes. I like all writers who do what they like, like Jeff Dyer's another one. They're nowhere near as famous as they should be because Sarah Pinborough is another one. People just want them to sort of do the same thing over and over again. Publishers love it when writers repeat things because they, they just want to spoon feed the public the same thing. And a lot of readers are like that. They want to be spoon fed. You know, we all have our comfort reads, but I don't. I want to be, you know, I want the bucket of water in the face. I want to be woken up and, you know, and, and I want to think, wow, you know, this is great. I want sort of to be unsettled and to be entertained by that flash and newness. And Thompson's really good at that. And his first book was a book called The Insult, which caused quite a splash, which is about a man who goes blind, um, except he's not really blind. People just think he is. And there's more to it than that, but it's really, really good. And this one is a dystopia, Divided Kingdom. And I'll just read what it says on the back. It says, one night a boy who comes to be called Thomas Parry is taken from his family, caught up in a comprehensive unravelling of what had been the United Kingdom. Reacting to their country's inexorable decline into consumerism, turpitude, racism and violence, the powers that be established four independent republics based on the perceived nature of the citizens assigned to each. These new partitions are reinforced with concrete barricades and razor wire. So people are divided up according to their temperament into four different temperaments, which is rather a medieval idea, you know, choleric and what have you. And um, it's really good and it's very poetic and dreamy. There's a wonderful surreal scene in a nightclub, I remember. And it doesn't have that hardness and sharpness, except at the beginning that a lot of dystopias have. So it's very different. And um, it's a real risk taker. And, you know, it gets compared to 1984 and Clockwork Orange, another great dystopian novel. And it is really good. So seek it out. It's quite popular. Um, I might be doing an event with Rupert sometime later this year. We are sort of talking about it. And um, even though I'm not his biggest fan where I work, a friend of mine is, um, he says he's too shy and, you know, they want me to do it. So, you know, I might step back in the arena and it would be interesting because he's a fascinating guy. So Divided Kingdom, seek it out, give it a go. The only thing it reminded me of in a way was a book which was quite different, which is a book called Albion Albion by Dick Morland, which if you can find looks like this. Now, Dick Morland was one of the pseudonyms of Reginald Hill, the crime writer who wrote Delil and Pasco. And there's a connection to Clockwork Orange there, because of course Warren Clark played one of the characters in the TV series. And Warren Clark, wonderful actor, of course, sadly no longer with us, like Reginald Hill. He um, played Dim in um, Kubrick's Clockwork Orange. And um, in that, Britain is divided up into sort of football supporting contingents. And I think there's four of them, North South, north south east and west i haven't read it for years it's be a faber book and it was available under another title before that and i can't remember what it was but if you ever see albion albion or heart clock which is another dystopian novel by dick mall and pick them up they're super rare in any edition super collectible i've read both of them they're not front rank but they're not bad and they're a show a writer at the period where he was trying to decide was he going to be an sf writer was he going to be a crime writer and of course he became a great success as a crime writer so dick mall and Heart Clock and Albion Albion. Dystopia is worth watching out for. Another crime writer who wrote a fantastic dystopian novel is the very wonderful Derek Raymond. And this is A State of Denmark. This is the Serpent's Tale paperback from way, way back. Terrible spine fade there. I've had this for many years. I think this goes back to the 80s or 90s, probably early 90s. Let's have a look. And 
let's see, first published in 1970. This is um, 1994 edition. Derek Raymond, his real name was Robin Cook. As a writer, he didn't use the name Robin Cook because there was already a famous um, writer of medical thrillers called Robin Cook. Coma is the big one. And of course, there's Robin Cook, the Labour politician, who wasn't sort of on the, the radar then so much. So he called himself Derek Raymond. And he went to Eton, I believe. And he was quite an interesting character, quite sort of upper class. But he got involved with all sorts of dodgy things in the 60s and he knew the craze and what have you. He was involved in low level criminality and he at one point had to run off to Italy or France. I think I think this book makes me think it's Italy. It might have been France. Um, but I'm sort of veering between the two. And he sort of worked around a vineyard and what have you. And he spent a lot of time out of the country. And he wrote um, some amazing hard-boiled, gritty British crime novels. I mean, British hard-boiled and grit is very, very small number of people. Ted Lewis, Raymond, um, Jay Garnett, you know, Anthony Fruin, who was Stanley Kubrick's assistant. There's a tiny number of them. And, you know, most British crime is, is fairly sort of, you know, safe and genteel. Even the stuff that claims to be tough. The real Brit grit is very, very uncommon. But Raymond came onto my um, radar in 1985 when they were being reissued, I think by Pan, who I worked for at that time. And he wrote a series of novels called The Factory Novels. This nameless detective who works out of a police station in Poland Street in central London, which is where William Blake was born. There's a video on my channel called About Poland Street, The Visionary Writer's Way, it's called. So I used to go to a pub in Poland Street a lot as well. And I'm going to film another a video about an anecdote about that, about my Radio 4 experiences one day. That'll be an interesting one. And this sort of cop, you know, he's, he's up against his, his sort of superiors who hate him and he's really sort of dedicated to the job and tortured by it and you know they are quite harrowing books they're fantastic one of them is called i was dora suarez and it's one of the most harrowing novels you'll ever read it really is genuinely terrible it's it's the heart of darkness writ large but anyway this is his science fiction novel his dystopian novel a state of denmark which is, of course is a shakespearean reference to hamlet and basically um, it's about a near future England ruled by a dictator called Jobling and the protagonist and narrator is a journalist who early in Jobling's career tries to expose sort of bad mannerism, how bad he would be for Britain if he, if he came to power. Haven't we seen that quite a few times? And unfortunately in this future Britain there's a secret police and you know Jobling has a long memory and the narrator Richard Watt he flees to Italy to run a vineyard and you know this is you know very much based on Raymond's own experience there and it shows Britain transitioning into a dictatorship and what happens and it's utterly realistic the only science fiction element is the political one it's um, science fiction of course can be soft science politics is a science it's a human science so we see this shift of Britain from a two-party mixed economy into a right-wing dictatorship and it's a really fantastic book subtle brilliant um uncompromising absolutely love it it is in print if you find it in a bookshop it'll probably be in the crime section you've come and see me it'll be in my science fiction section if we have it in stock at that point um it's probably his least known book um and it's absolutely fantastic so derek raymond a state of denmark wonderful dystopian political novel read it what else do we have? Well, I'm going to give you some more political dystopia, I'm afraid, whether you like it or not. And if you have any sense, you will, because, you know, it's all about broadening stuff. Um, one of my favourite writers who I really revere is a Swede. I say is a Swede, he was. He's dead now, sadly. He died way back in the 70s. And that's Per Wallow. Per Wallow. Per Wallow, I revere thee above many, many others. And he wrote this diptych of, this diptych, I should say, of science fiction crime dystopias and they feature a character called Inspector Jensen near future unnamed country and this is the first one murder on the 31st floor and this is the second one the steel spring these are out of print now I think they came into print briefly about 10 years ago they didn't read really do very well they end up in remainder shops and they are absolutely fantastic and he wrote these two in the early 60s and Walu was a journalist he was a Marxist and he had a partner called Maj, Maj Schwal. Maj Schwal. I was trying to get the pronunciation of these things right. And Maj Schwal, and she's still alive. She must be about 90. And as Schwal and Walu, they wrote a series of 10 crime novels beyond these together. 
um, the Shvalo Marlo series, which are called The Story of a Crime, 10 volume novel following a detective called Martin Beck um, in modern Scandinavia and modern Sweden from the late 60s through to the mid 70s. They're also known as the Martin Beck series. There have been numerous screen adaptations, mostly in Scandinavia. There is one just called Beck, which is a series which is often streaming in the UK. You can get DVDs and what have you. And it's not very good. Um, it's OK in itself, but it's nothing like the books at all. Not at all. So if you think, oh, I've seen that, it does fairly dull. Don't worry about it. It's nothing to do with it at all. It's just using the character's name. And that's pretty much it. And the Martin Beck series, The Story of a Crime, is a fantastic portrait of sort of welfare state Sweden, you know, which was supposed to be a utopia back in the 60s and 70s. And you get this amazing spiralling, broadening portrait of what crime in the city and what have you was really like in Sweden. It's a fantastic series of books. All of human life is in them. Comedy, drama, horror, the lot, Gordian not plotting. And the last two, I've read them twice and my heart was in my mouth both times, even the second time. Fantastic stuff. So there is a video about them on my channel. So, but before then, Peer Walu was writing novels alone without Mar Shualu, his partner, and these are two of them. And they are just wonderfully well written, taut, sharp dystopias. And basically, near future, unnamed country, and you get this Chief Inspector Jensen, and he's called to look at. Um, there's, these pub, there's a publisher and they have like a building which contains all their editorial offices and the printing presses in the basement. And they have a threat, a terrorist threat. Somebody says they're going to blow up the building. And the building's evacuated. The bomb isn't sort of found. No bomb is found. And the inspector then has seven days to track down whoever wrote the threatening letter. And it's very, very Kafkaesque and looping and strange and enigmatic but utterly compelling it puts a hook in you and really 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 good and he discovers that in the building there is a secret a secret department um the 31st floor i won't tell you anymore fantastic stuff even better because that really does leave you guessing is its sequel the steel spring and it's jensen again and in this this is about a an outbreak a pandemic in this unnamed country and um, you know the thing about this country it's like if you're not allowed to get drunk it's illegal to get drunk in this country um, not even at home on your own and you know and lots of places are demolished to, to build motorways and what have you and it's interesting because Sweden of course they used to have very very carefully regulated drinking that you could you can only buy so much booze every month and Hugh Cormor from the Stranglers related an anecdote when he lived in Sweden when he was in the, in the early 70s when he was a biochemist researcher and he had a rock band there called Johnny Socks who eventually moved to the UK and mutated into the Stranglers he said there was one night where everybody obeyed the rules and he said basically there's one night where they decided everybody would drive on a different side of the road and nobody was allowed out for about four hours while they changed the signs around or something and everybody obeyed it and what have you that's slightly different to what you get in the martin beck thing but um you do get that thing of a slightly sort of overly careful sort of utopia dystopia and this is absolutely fantastic and jensen has to go out to the country during this pandemic because he needs an operation abroad and when he goes back well or he tries to go back fascinating stuff so that's the diptych of Inspector Jensen from Pirwalu. Marvellous political dystopias. Really recommend those fantastic books. I think I saved the best for last, really. And I think if I were to name one um, novel, which to me measures up to 1984, to Brave New World, to We, to The Iron Heel, to Friday Night 451, um, it's this book. Molly Zero by Keith Roberts, which I think is absolutely sublime. I'm a massive Keith Roberts fan. And this is one of the most neglected and unfairly neglected books of the 20th century. Roberts these days is mostly known for Pavan. 
his brilliant alternative history in which Elizabeth I is assassinated, the Spanish Armada wins, and in 1966 Britain is still under Catholic rule and science has been suppressed. Wonderful, wonderful novel and alongside The Man in the High Castle, generally regarded as the finest alternative history novel ever. This is Molly Zero from 1980. This is the original Golang's World First Edition hardcover. It didn't come out in paperback for five years afterwards. It came out as a Penguin paperback in 1985, five years from hardcover to paperback. Not because it sold incredibly well, it didn't. It's had a usual run, it sold a bit and that was it. It took five years because Keith was so difficult and everybody loved his work. They thought he was a genius, but he was a difficult man to deal with. As I've mentioned in the Kerasina video, if you watch that, it gives you a full story of what it was like um, from the point of view of a small press publisher working with Keith. And eventually Penguin, They'd been publishing Pavan for some time in King Penguin. They did a reissue of The Furies, his first novel, which is wonderful if you like John Wyndham. Great, great book. Great book anyway. Uh, better writer than Wyndham, really, but obviously very much later than him and under his thrall to a degree. Uh, Molly Zero is an amazing dystopian novel. Not only is it a great dystopian novel, I would also say it sort of set the standard, you know, without people even realising, for what came years and years and years later when YA started to become a thing a bit earlier in this century in this country and you know you got sort of teen dystopias like the Hunger Games and what have you Molly Zero got there first and got there better and got there in an adult way <clears throat> the amazing thing about this book is that it's second person present tense all the way through now second person present tense is an uncommon mode of writing. It gives enormous immediacy, but hardly anybody can do it and pull it off and make it work. So it goes like this. You walk into the room, you turn the light on. It's still too dim. You pull the curtains. So it puts you in the character's head all the way through. And this is what this book does. And it puts you in the head of a young girl called Molly Zero. She lives in a dystopian post-nuclear Britain where children are not brought up by their parents. They're taken away from their parents and they are raised in, they are raised in blocks, dormitories, and they are tested. And they are tested in all sorts of different ways to see where they will fit in society. And Molly Zero is going to be groomed for the leading elite. And this is simply magnificent. The first third of it was published in a Fontana anthology edited by Robert Silverberg called Triax, which you see, and um, that's only part of the story. And this is really, really, really quite something. Not only is the prose stunning in its astringency and its immediacy and in its descriptive quality, Robert is a genius of character studies and he's very, very well known for tender and yet cruel depictions of young female characters probably because he was a man who never settled down never married he did have relationships um, but the sort of general consensus is that there were lots of things were unresolved um, so he created um, these often very beautiful and flawed female characters um, particularly young ones and he followed them through their lives in the books as people like Katie and um, Anita and the witch Anita the witch stories and and this velvet in um, Kite World and so on. And Molly Zero for me is the greatest of them all. And you follow this, follow Molly through, you know, all sorts of things as she goes through this dystopian society being tested. And it's an absolutely wonderful, wonderful book. There has never, ever, ever been a mass market paperback edition of this, apart from the original Penguin one, which had one printing, which is disgraceful. This is one of the finest dystopian novels ever. It's absolute work of genius literature and I'm not just saying it subjectively I think if Anthony Burgess were alive and Anthony Burgess selected Pavan for um, 99 novels the best novels in the English language since 1945 I think Burgess I think lots of other critics if they'd read this would have agreed it's a fantastic book and even though it has a structure which later becomes familiar in the Hegira of a young female character through a dystopia. This is not a book for children, it's a book for adults. Um, I, would, I would be quite happy if any teenager, if I had a teenage child and they wanted to read this, I'd be delighted. Um, sadly, you can't get it. Cosmos Wildside did a print on demand edition probably about 20 years ago. Um, it should be a Gollum's masterwork. I mean, all of Keith's books should be Gollum's masterworks. They should all be in print because he was fantastic. So if you ever see any copy of Molly Zero, snap it up. and. It has a fantastic 
conceptual breakthrough at the very end in the last word, in the last line and the last word absolutely magnificent stunning sf novel and personally outside the obvious classics my favorite dystopian novel of all time so i'm going to leave you with that there's a bit of dystopian recommendations for you we'll do more dystopias another time this is outlook bookseller um hope you enjoyed that please subscribe if you haven't to more sf to come more general fiction to come out and about rock and roll all sorts of stuff signing out for now it's saturday morning i think it's time to get out there bye for now